Hello, welcome to Sigma Tech Learning Hall. I'll be your instructor for biology. For this class, we are going to be taking our exercises from the exam guide app. Now, if you don't already have this installed in your device, I would like you to download the app in order to follow along in this class. Now, exam guide is a leading educational app that helps students prepare adequately for various exams. Exams such as the UTME, the post-UTME, WIEC, GCE, IGMB, KCPE, JUPEB, Calbepedia. In the junior sections, we also have the BECE, we have the JSCE, and so much more. Now, you can download the app from www.examguide.com or you visit the Google Play Store to download. Now, please subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification bell to update yourselves on new videos that will be coming up. Now, if you're ready for this class, let's get started. Today, we're going to be talking about cell as a living unit of an organism. Cell as a living unit of an organism. <coughs> Remember, we have discussed about cells initially when we we're talking about um, levels of organizations of life. So today we're going to be talking about the cells in details. We're going to discuss a lot of things about the cells. Now, there are several objectives um, I'm expecting or we're expecting you to be able to do. And um, with, uh, one of them is by the end of this lesson, you should be able to define a cell. You should be able to also state what we call the cell theory. There is a cell theory. We're going to look at it. Number three, you should be able to mention the forms in which cells exist and also give some examples in each of these forms. Number four, you should be able to mention some cell organelles and their functions, that is, components of the cells and what they do. Number five, you should be able to draw the structure and able to identify parts of the structures of a plant cell and also that of an animal cell is very vital. And number six, you should be able to outline some similarities between plant and animal cell and also some differences between plants and animal cell. Okay, let's start with the first one, which has to do with a definition of a cell. And please also, please take note of the highlighted um, um, words that are colored in red. Please take note of them. Now, what are cells? By definition, we said that cells are the simplest, smallest, basic, structural, fundamental, or functional unit of life. So any of these keywords you use in your definition of a cell is correct. You can say cell is the smallest, sm simplest and smallest unit of life, you're correct. You can say cells are the basic and structural unit of life, you're very correct. If you say, you can also say cells are the fundamental and functional unit of life, you're also what? Correct. So whichever of those highlighted words you make use of, you are very correct in your definition of a cell. Next thing I want you to understand is that living organisms can be classified into two basic groups based on their number of cells. Now before I go into that, I want you to understand this, <clears throat> that all living things are made up of cells. All living things are made up of cells. Please remember this. All living things, which includes plants, which includes animals, which includes unicellular, multicellular organisms, everything that is alive has cells in them, okay? Now, living organisms, like we said before, <clears throat> can be grouped into two based on their number of cells. Number one is unicellular organisms. We're going to be talking about them. Number two is multicellular organisms. Now, what are unicellular organisms? Unicellular organisms are actually organisms that are made up of just one cell. Organisms made up of just one cell. And these organisms can also be called single-celled organisms. As you can know the word, as you can see in the uh, word, single means one. The same thing in unicellular organism, uni, 
talks about one. So these are organisms that are made up of just a single cell, and that single cell can carry out all activities of life. It can carry out all activities of life. And of course, you know the activities of life which are the characteristics of life. Just a single cell can move, the cell can respire, the cell can feed, the cells can respond to, to external environment, the cells grow, the cells excrete, the cells reproduce. The cells even compete with other cells. The cells also adapt to the environment and one day the cells will die. Okay? So that it is a single cell does not mean that it does not carry out all functions of life. It carries out all activities, all life processes. Okay? Now examples of unicellular organisms or single-celled organisms include euglena, amoeba, <coughs> paramecium, plasmodium, chlamydomonas, and so many others. Trypanosome, they are all examples of unicellular organism. As you can see in the diagram, we have an amoeba, which is an example, which is an example of a unicellular organism. Now, the next is multicellular organism. Now, what are multicellular organisms? Multicellular organisms are actually organisms that are made up of more than one cell. You can call them, they are made up of many cells, okay? So, in other words, for multicellular organism is simply many-celled organisms. Many-celled organisms. Okay, so they are made up of more than one cell. And these cells aggregate together, of course we know this, and they perform a particular function as a tissue. And the tissues aggregate to form organs, organs aggregate to form systems, and then systems aggregate to form the body of an organism. Okay, so the organism is actually made up of, a multicellular organism rather, is actually made up of many cells, many cells. Examples include higher plants and animals. Higher plants and animals. Right. Example of a higher animal is you and I. Okay, we have mammals. Mammals are examples of higher animals. Higher plants include the di uh, dicotyledonous plants, like the mango plant. We have the orange plant. These are higher plants. Okay, we also have volvox. We have hydra. We have uh, 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 spirogyra. We have even the snail. The snail is an example of a multicellular organism, as you can see on the structure there on the screen. Now, cells also can also be defined or classified based on the presence of the nucleus in the cell. I repeat, cells can also be classified into two based on the presence of nucleus in the cell. Now we have what we call prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells. Number two, we have what we call eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells. Now let's take a look at what prokaryotic cells are. Now prokaryotic cells are actually cells that do not have definite nucleus. So you don't see what was called a nuclear membrane surrounding it. Now, if you look at the structure we have there, which is a bacteria, which is an example of a prokaryotic cell, you can tell in the labelings there, there is nothing like a nucleus. There is nothing like a nuclear membrane. What you have is the content of a nucleus being displayed, which is the chromosomal DNA. The chromosomal DNA is usually found inside of the nucleus and it is enclosed in a nuclear membrane. So once, once there is an absence of this nuclear membrane enclosing the chromosomal DNA, we call such kind, um, such kind of cell a prokaryotic cell. So bacteria is an example of a prokaryotic cell and also all examples of kingdom monerans are also examples of prokaryotic cells. Example of, another example of prokaryotic cell is seen in the blue-green algae, which is also known as nostoc. Now, next is eukaryotic cells. 
eukaryotic cells. Now, eukaryotic cells are cells with definite nucleus. It simply means that the DNA, the chromosomes, are all enclosed in a nuclear membrane, which is known as the nucleus. Okay? So they have a definite nucleus. Examples include the paramecium, amoeba, euglena, volvox, hydra, spirogyra, higher plants, and animals. Now, if you look at that structure of the euglena, you are going to notice in one of the labels, you can see my cursor showing it, that is the nucleus. We said it is a membrane that encloses the chromosomes and the DNA. Okay, so once we have such a structure, it simply means that particular cell is referred to as a eukaryotic word, cells. So in other words, what we are saying is that cells can also be classified into two based on the presence of the nucleus in the cells. And we have the prokaryotic cells and the eukaryotic cells. Now, let's take a look to... Um, a brief history of cells. Let's look at the brief history of cells. Now, there are so many scientists that, um, whose work contributed to the discovery of cells, a lot of them. We're going to be looking at just very few of them that their works brought about the discovery of cells. But the first person to come up with the discovery of cells was an English scientist called Robert Hooke. And he did that in 1665. In 1665, he observed a magnified thin slice of the cork of an oak tree. And there he discovered several things, structures, which he later called the cells, or which he later called cells. And that brought about the discovery of cells. Like we said initially, many scientists also contributed in terms of their work to the discovery of cells. We have, um, uh, I think that was in 19, sorry, in um, 1835, there was a scientist called um, uh, Felix Dujardin. Felix Dujardin. He was a French biologist, a French scientist, Felix Dujardin in 1835. He, he actually discovered that cells are made up of living substances. He discovered that cells are made up of living substances. These living substances he called protoplasm, protoplasm. Also in 1838, there was also another scientist called Matthias Kledin. I think Matthias Kledin discovered that plant bodies are made up of cells. Remember we said that all living things are made up of cells. Matthias Kledin came up with a discovery that all that plant bodies are made up of cells. And also in 1838, Theodore Swan also came up with a discovery that animal bodies are also made up of what? Cells. And also in, um, I think, 1855, yes, in 1855, there was also a German biologist by name Rudolf von Virchow. Rudolf von Virchow also came up or discovered something, and he discovered that cells come from previously existing cells. Now, most of these discoveries from these scientists brought up what we call today, or brought up the postulation of what we call today the cell theory. Okay? Now, let's take a look at the cell theory. We have five of them, five theories about the cells. And please take note of them. They are very important, and you should remember them. Number one is that cells are the structural and functional unit of life. Cells are the structural and functional unit of life. Number two is that all living things, all living organisms are made up of cells. You can agree with me, uh, that was one of the postulations from two scientists, which is Matthias Kledin and Theodor Swan in 1838 and 1839. Uh, both of them discovered that plants and animals uh, are made up of cells. So all living organisms are made up of cells. Number three is that all cells come from previously existing cells. And that was one of the discoveries of Rudolf von Virchow in 1855. Rudolf von Virchow came up with a discovery that cells come from previously existing cells. Number four cell theory is that there is no life 
apart from the life of a cell. It simply means if all the cells are dead in a living organism, that living organism has no life. There is no life apart from the life of a cell. And number five, we said that all living things are either unicellular and or multicellular. They are either unicellular or multicellular. We talked about that when we said that cells are divided into two based on the number of cells in the organism. Organisms, rather, are divided into two based on the number of cells. So all living things are either unicellular or multicellular. Now let's move to the next, microscope. Microscope. Now it is very important you understand that cells are so tiny. They are so tiny that you can't view them except with the aid of a microscope. Cells are so small that you can't view them with your naked eyes except with the aid of a microscope. Now, these organisms that cannot be viewed without a microscope or that cannot be viewed with the naked eyes are referred to as microscopic organisms. Microscopic organisms. They are referred to as microscopic organisms. Now, microscopes are actually instruments used in the laboratory to observe smaller structures or tiny structures of living organisms that cannot be visible to the naked eyes. Now, let's take a look at types of microscope. Types of microscope. Now, we have about four different types of microscope we use in the laboratory in biology lab. We have the hand lens, we have the light microscope, we have the compound microscope, and then we have the electron microscope. Now, take a look at the hand lens. This is what we call a hand lens. Then also look at what we call a light microscope. This is a light microscope. We also have the compound microscope. The compound microscope. We have this as the electron microscope. Now, out of all the four types of microscope, it is the electron microscope that has the highest magnification power. It has the highest magnification power. Now, parts of a microscope. Now, we have several parts that makes up a microscope. Now, if we're using a light microscope, you will see in the structure there that a microscope has what we call an eyepiece. An eyepiece. That is where the viewer actually views or sees or what he wants to view from the microscope. Okay, that's where the viewer views or observes. Then we also have um, the revolving uh, nozzle piece. Now the revolving nozzle piece rotates, rotates the objectives. Okay, we have different objectives with different uh, 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 magnification strengths. Okay, so for which one you want to take can be easily selected by the revolving no space, okay? Then we also have the stage. The stage is where you place the slide containing the organism you want to view. Containing the organism you want to view, that is the stage. Then we also have what we call the stage clip. The stage clip helps to clip down the slide so that it doesn't move or shake. Clips down the slide so it doesn't move or shake. We also have the adjustment knobs. We have two adjustment knobs. We have what we call the fine adjustment knob and we have the coarse adjustment knob. Now these adjustment knobs helps to bring or fine tune the image you are actually looking at, making it fine, making it good for you to um, view correctly, okay? It gives it a better contrast, okay? Then finally, we also have the base where uh, the microscope rests on your table bench in the lab, right? Now, moving ahead, let's look at forms in which cells exist. Now, cells exist in several forms, but we have basically four different forms in which cells exist. Now, let's take a look at number one. Number one is cells exist as independent 
or they exist as free living. That is, it looks as a single cell, okay? It is actually a single cell that moves around and it can carry out all life processes. Number two is that cells can exist as a colony. Cells exist as colonies. Cells can also exist, number three, as a filament. Cells can exist as a filament. And then number four, cells exist as part of a living organism. They exist as part of a living organism. Now, as independent of free living. Now, these are organisms that possess only one cell, like I said before. They are just a single cell, but they are capable of existing on their own freely. They can exist on their own and carry out life processes. And these life processes are what we call characteristics of living things. They exist on their own and they carry out life processes. Remember I said they are just one-celled organism. Examples include the amoeba, the paramecium we can, we can see on the screen, the euglena, the chlamydominus, and so on. These organisms exist as independent of free-living organisms. The next is as a colony. Cells can exist as a colony. Now, these are organisms that are made up of many cells. As you can see on the screen, there are many tiny spherical cells that are found there, and they are held together by what we call a cytoplasmic strand. These cells don't, uh, they depend solely on each other. They cannot be differentiated from each other. They are dependent on each other. Each of these cells are dependent on each other. That is why we call it a colony. Actually, a colony is a group of organisms that associate together. Groups of organisms that associate together and depend on each other. So they associate together and depend on each other. Now, examples of um, cells that exist as colonies, we have the, um, we have, um, the volvox. We have the volvox, which is on the screen. We also have sponges. We have what we call pandorina. These are examples of organisms or examples of cells that exist as colonies. Next is as filaments. There are cells that exist as filaments. Cells exist as filaments. Now, as filaments, they are made up of identical cells which are joined end to end to form an unbranched filament. They are joined end to end to form an unbranched filament. Examples, we have the spirogyra, we have the zygnema, and so on. As you can see on the screen, that is a spirogyra. It is joined end to end. And you can see the spiral chloroplast that is found in it. Also, cells can exist as part of a living organism. As part of a living organism. Now, numerous cells aggregate together to form a tissue and they perform a specific function. They aggregate together to form tissues. Tissues then aggregate together to form organs. Organs then aggregate together to form systems, and these systems also aggregate together to form an entire body of an organism, of a living organism. That is what we call as part. So the cell is part of the living organism as a whole. The cell is part of the living organism as a whole, okay? Examples of, of um, cells that exist as part of a living organism are cells that are found in higher plants and higher animals. As you can see on the screen, we have the rat. The cells that are found in the rat are cells that are part of a living organism. They aggregate together, they form tissues. The tissues aggregate together, they form organs. The organs aggregate together, they form system, and the systems aggregate together to form the entire body of this organism called the rat. All right? Next, let's look at structures of both plant cell and animal cell. Look at the structure, a simple structure of a plant cell. Take a good look at some of the uh, components that are found in these cells. 
we have the Golgi bodies, Golgi vesicles, we have the ribosomes, we have the cell wall, we have the cell membrane, we have the chloroplast. You can also see the mitochondria. We also have the cytoplasm. We have the nucleus. Are you seeing that? We also have the endoplasmic reticulum and so on. We're going to be looking at um, some of the functions of each of these parts as we have seen in the plant cell as well as in the animal cell. So looking at the animal cell, that is what it looks like. <clears throat> you can also see some similarities between animal cell and plant cell. You can see that there is a mitochondria in the animal cell. You can also see there is a nucleus in the um, animal cell. You can also see endoplasmic reticulum. You can see lysosomes. You can see cytoplasms. You can see nucleus. You can see ribosomes and so many others. Now, let's take a look at important components of the cells. These components can also be called cell organelles. So whenever you hear the word cell organelles, they are simply talking about components of the cell. What makes up a cell? Now, let's look at some of them. Number one is the nucleus. It's one of the most important parts of a cell, the nucleus. Now, what are the major functions of the nucleus? Number one, it controls all life activities in the cell. All life activities of the cell. Number two is that it stores hereditary information. Why? It contains what we call DNA. The DNA that is found in the, is found in the chromosome, the DNA contains hereditary information. And it is what is transmitted from parents to offspring or from one generation to another. Number two cell organelle is the chromosomes. The chromosomes. Now, the chromosomes, they contain DNA. We have said it. The chromosomes are located inside the nucleus. The chromosomes contain DNA. Now, the reason why I am bringing out the chromosome from the nucleus is simple. There are some cells that are prokaryotic. We have discussed this, and we have said that they don't have nucleus per se. What you see is chromosomal DNA. So that is why we brought it out as chromosomes. Do you understand? Number three, mitochondria. Mitochondria. Now, mitochondria, another name for mitochondria is called the powerhouse of the cell. Now, why is it called powerhouse? Of course, you know power is ability to do work. So ability, energy that is being released to carry out life processes is released from the mitochondria. So the mitochondria is the site for respiration, where energy is released. One of the purpose for respiration is to release energy in order to carry out metabolic activities or life processes. So that energy is produced from the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is the site, mostly, of aerobic respiration. Next, number four, we have the vacuoles. Vacuoles. Now, the vacuoles in plants, they contain cell sap. They contain cell sap. Also, in animals, we have what we call the contractile vacuoles. The contractile vacuoles, they carry out a function we call osmoregulation. Their maintenance of the water and salt balance inside of the body. So it helps to remove excess water. Mostly the contractor vacuoles in some animals helps to remove excess water from the cells of those organisms. Number five is the nucleus. Now it is located within the nucleus and it produces the ribosomes. The nucleus produces the ribosomes. Now number six, what are ribosomes? Now, ribosomes are responsible for protein synthesis or for the manufacturing of or production of proteins. Ribosomes are necessary or necessary for the synthesis of proteins. We have number seven, which is the lysosomes. Now, the lysosomes are the site for respiratory enzymes. Respiratory enzymes, site for respiratory enzymes. Number eight is the chloroplast. The chloroplast. The chloroplast contains what we call chlorophyll. 
And chlorophyll is one of the major conditions that are necessary for photosynthesis to occur mostly in green plants. Necessary for photosynthesis to occur in green plants. Number nine is endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum. Now, the endoplasmic reticulum, we have both the rough and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Now, the function of the endoplasmic reticulum is to transport materials within the cytoplasm of the cell. They transport materials within the cytoplasm of the cell. Number 10, we will be looking at Golgi bodies. Golgi bodies. It is responsible for the synthesis, packing, and distribution of materials in the cell or in the cytoplasm of the cell. 11 is the cell wall. The cell wall provides protection, provides shape, and mechanical support for the cell. Number two function of the cell wall is that it allows free passage of, of nutrients or materials in and out of the cell. Number 12 is cell membrane. It plays a great role in selective absorption of materials, mostly when we are looking at things like osmosis. So it plays a great role in selective absorption of materials. And the second function of the cell membrane is that it also protects the cell. Thirteen is the centrioles. The centrioles is mostly important in cell division. Centrioles, mostly important in cell division. We also have the starch granules. Starch granules. Now, the starch granules stores starch for the cell. We also have the glycogen granules, which stores... Um, we also have the granules or vacuoles, which also stores glycogen, not just starch. In animals, it is glycogen, while in plants, it stores starch. And then finally, we have the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is the liquid part or the liquid medium within the cell in which all chemical reactions take place at cellular level. All chemical reactions take place in the cytoplasm of the cell. Now, the next thing to look at is similarities between plant and animal cell. What are the similarities we can draw out? Number one, both plant and animal cells have a nucleus. If you take your mind back and go back and you, you, you view the cell structure of plants and then the animal uh, cell structure, you are going to see that both of them possess nucleus. Another thing, again, both of them possess is mitochondria. Mitochondria. Also, they both possess cytoplasm. They both possess cytoplasm. Both of them also possess chromosomes. Since they have nucleus, it means that both plant and animal cells also have chromosomes. Both plant and animal cells also have cell membrane. Plant and animal cells also have Golgi bodies and ribosomes. Now, let's take a look at some of the differences between plant and animal cell. Now, in terms of differences, we're looking at just five differences. Very important. Number one, in plant cell, the plant cell has rigid cell walls. Rigid cell walls. That is, the cell walls are firm. Okay? And that is why most times, plant cells have a, a definite shape and structure. But animal cells do not have rigid cellulose cell wall. Animal cells do not have rigid cellulose cell wall. In fact, animal cells don't have cell walls. Plant cells have cell walls. Number two is that plant cells have large vacuoles. Large vacuoles. Animal cells have small vacuoles. Number three, animal plant cells have what we call chloroplasts. And I told you that chloroplast contains what we call chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is very important. In fact, it's one of the major conditions for photosynthesis to take place in green plants. So plant cells, mostly green plants, have chloroplast. But no animal cell has pl uh, chloroplast. They lack chloroplast. Number four, plant cell contains starch granules. Remember, we just talked about scratch granules. So plant cell contains starch granules, 
animal cell contain glycogen granules. And then number five, plant cell are usually larger in size compared to animal cells. Okay, now let's take a look at some um, question, SSC questions from our exam, exam guide app. All right, let's go to the exam guide. Now, we have so many questions here we can look out for. But let's take a look at this um, first question. I'm just going to pick very few questions while you practice more on some of the other questions. Now, let's take a look at question one. They said animal cells are different from plant cells because animal cells have what? Remember, we just finished talking about differences between plants and animals. So A, they said large vacuoles. B, definite cell wall. C, centrals. D, chloroplast. They are looking at differences between animal cell from plant cell. Now, animal cells don't have large vacuoles, no. Animal cells do not have cell walls, no. Animal cells do not have chloroplasts, no. The correct answer is supposed to be C, which is what? Centrals. It is involved in cell division. Look at question two. They said, which of the following best describes a colony of vulvox? A, a sexually reproduced cell held together in a mass but independent, wrong. We said that they are dependent. Now look at option B. They say several units of cells held by a cytoplasmic strand and dependent on each other. That is the correct option. Look at option C. They said sexually reproduced cells, which is very wrong. Then look at D. They say single free living. That is not correct. So colon, uh, Volvox, they, are, they exist in colonies. They don't exist as single free living cells. So our correct option here is B. Okay? So I'll let you practice more. We have about 46 questions on this particular topic we have treated. Go through them and I will see you in our next class. Thank you for participating in today's class. You can practice more questions using your exam guide app. The app scores and gives a detailed explanation of all the questions at the end of your practice test. You can also learn particular topics of interest with different modes like study mode, uh, mock mode, and even practice mode. It, is also, it also has other features that makes learning very fun. Now, it is a must for all serious students. Download from www.examguide.com if you don't have it yet. See you in the next class. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels, hit the notifi notification bell, and share the videos to your loved ones and friends that will benefit from it. Bye for now.